Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, with the addition of more and more dedicated bike lanes on major thoroughfares, some county residents think there is a vendetta against drivers. As the end of another year approaches, was 2022 noticeably different than the two previous COVID years? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former county council member, Nancy Florine, former county council member, Mike Knapp, former delegate, Marise Morales, and the secretary of the Maryland Republican Central Committee, once again, Mark Unkefer. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Driving home from a Christmas party the other evening, I was struck by the fact, well, number one, I was driving home from a Christmas party, but number two, <laughs> just how normal the evening was. Attendees were in good spirits. There was laughter to be heard, lots of good cheer, and nary a mask in sight, especially the servers weren't forced to mask up. I thought that was important as well. Last year, I reflected on my notes from the past shows and Dominant discussion about Omicron was, was hot, the hot topic in December and early January, and whether it was going to be as deadly as, as its pre predecessors. And the other question was, how was going to would government react? What a relief. Things are different now. Mike, when I review my notes, there seems to be three distinct patterns. You know, during the first quarter of the year, COVID was still the dominant topic, while the impact on our school children their health, their mental health, and their learning was also being discussed. And also rising crime rate was being detected in the first part of the year. But what strikes you as the most significant changes from this past year? I think the most significant changes really are um, the new normal, that we don't go, we're not going back to where we once were, that people still are trying to evolve. I, I, I had to go down to DC the other day and parked at Metro and got there about quarter of nine and realized that had I done that three years ago, I wouldn't have found a place except maybe on the top on the top of the parking deck. And I pulled in the front row and managed to park. And so I think there's a there's a people are still trying to kind of figure out what that normal is, but there's an acceptance to things that we would have never accepted three years ago, and, and a flexibility and a dynamism around how people are how people are operating and how they're getting back to work and what that looks like and how accommodating I think we are relative to where we've been. I think that's really exciting. Um, and I agree with you. I think that there's also a set of, there's a normalcy that people are finally coming out to events and can just feel comfortable and talk to each other again. And that's, I think that's still happening for the, fir for the first times. Um, and I think people are really excited about that. So Nancy, you've had the benefit of, of traveling, not only in the United States, but also overseas. Do you see any differences in how we in Montgomery County are reacting to, the, to this year or not? Or not? You know, I got off a plane last night where 50% of the people wore masks. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would have to say, uh, I, I think it's an evolution. And it may be that we may be where we're going to be. I know people who still really won't leave their homes. Uh, uh, you know, people send Christmas, started to send Christmas cards again, but this is also uh, an issue for some. So it may be an age issue. I can't say for sure. Um, but I do think it's changed everything. It certainly changed how we work and how we get together. How many, look at us, we're on Zoom. Uh, are we ever gonna go back to, get, to meet in person? We'll see. Uh, same with uh, commissions, boards. I, you know, my board of directors, we're 50-50 uh, on Zoom meetings. It's convenient. It makes it easy for people to participate. On the other hand, you don't have to have personal interaction. And I think that's something we're, we're just resol revolving through in terms of thinking about how we communicate, how we work together. I think that's going to continue. So, so, so Mark, we've heard both from, from Mike and, and Nancy about the new normal. Where, where, where are we going? Well, and I think the pick up on, on the point that they both made, um, you know, the secret sauce for Montgomery County has been its physical proximity to the federal government for, for jobs, for contractors, for, for, for a whole host of, of reasons. And in general, the Washington DC area has been slower than other parts of the country to go back to in-person uh, 
rest of the country is, is slow as well, but we're a little bit slower. This is a, a long-term, uh, very significant effect, uh, trend that will have a huge effect on, on Montgomery County as people decide, you know what, I can live in Baltimore or West Virginia or wherever it is, Charlotte, I mean, uh, we don't have to be quite so close. Um, and that's gonna affect a lot about uh, what Montgomery County has, has had as a strength. That's interesting. Uh, Mara, say so you've also been traveling recently. You were in California. And what's the different vibe? I mean, is there just a, di I feel like there's just a different vibe uh, in December of 22 than there was in December of 2021. 100%, 100% Casey. I would say that um, just looking back at last year, there, there lacks a cohesive message, even within the state. So if, you know, I'm in court every other, every other day, I can go into one courthouse, and people are all masked out. And you know, within 25 minutes, like going from Silver Spring to maybe to Hyattsville, there's a whole different uh, sense you know, within the courthouse. And a lot of people would follow the example, right? Like if, it's, if I'm going to the courthouse and nobody's wearing a mask and that really sends a message. And coming back from California, the airports were very much, there's a whole mess, like there's a whole message campaign about, you know, I'm still wearing my mask. And before California, I was in Peru, Casey. So over there, everybody's wearing masks all the time. But I think just looking at, you know, that there, there has been a 33% increase of COVID infections in the last two weeks in Montgomery County. You know, we're averaging 183 cases per day. So I think, you know, as we're getting gathering again, and I think it's important, I know that the Biden administration is going to be sending out uh, COVID kits, uh, I think, up this, this come, uh, upcoming week. So I think we should take advantage of that. And, and um, but at, at this point, I think people are really kind of just taking some personal responsibility and um, and I think people do enjoy to have that kind of independent, you know, autonomy as to, you know, how strict they want to be uh, during this, these upcoming holidays. Well, I think I think we're we're all we're all glad we're beginning to to move on to to whatever the new normal is. But we're a political talk show, <laughs> and this was uh, the you know an important year in the county for several reasons. First, there was a gubernatorial contest uh, was a hot topic, but there was no other hot you know hotter topic than the primary race for county executive which was once again decided after a recount of ballots. You know, Mark, uh, I'm gonna ask you for your reaction since, you know, you're the lone Republican on the show today, this, this, this week. What's your take on that, that election? Well, isn't it fascinating that it, it was not only just the same result, but uh, obviously the same result in the sense of uh, such a, a, you know, closely divided race, David Blair almost winning, but uh, Mark Elridge uh, obviously prevailing. I, you know, going back to COVID, I, I think one of the strengths that Mark Elridge had was that his take on COVID reflected Montgomery County's preference to be that much more secure and safe. Um, and other jurisdictions may have had a, a different approach to it, but that uh, that really reflected what folks were interested mm -hmm. in in this county. Um, and I think that uh, helped, him, helped him ultimately just get over, obviously, by a very narrow margin to get reelected again. You know, uh, Mike, you know, there's obviously other races that were going on, so, but please feel free to comment on the executive race. We also saw a major shift in the county council with the expansion from uh, nine members to 11. So your, your take. Well, I, I, think, I think Mark is right a little bit on the county executive race that um, Mark did what was needed to do that reflected the county as it related to COVID. And I think the corollary to that also is that as a result of that, his time was so focused on that, he didn't do other things. And so there really weren't things to go after him on because he was so focused on COVID and that really you know, took up most of the time. I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next four years now that he's not shackled with that. And I think you've already seen some, some, some initial shots across the bow. And I think it'll be very interesting um, and much more contentious in the next four years than there was not was in the last four years with him. Um, the exciting thing, though, is in addition to the 11 um, count, new council members um, is having a majority of six women. And I think that is going to be really exciting. It will change the dynamic of the council significantly. And I don't even necessarily, I can't anticipate the different ways it will happen, but it will. And, and it's going to be really fun to watch and see how that interaction takes place and what that means for the county in the, over the next four years. So that, that's really a great transition to Nancy, uh, because uh, Nancy served a long, long time. Uh, weren't you the only woman at one point on the on the council, I think? Uh, no, um, at the end, it was 
myself and Nancy Navarro, of course, you know, people can never keep us straight. Uh, so there was that problem. <laughs> so, so, so Nancy, what do you, what, you know, what, what, what do you think we're going to have a more activist county council now? Well, you know, the thing about this council is a number of them are real newbies in terms of being in politics. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. You know, I'm not sure that it, I mean, as a woman, I'm glad that actually for once the county council reflects the community. Uh, and I think that's important for the community, uh, but it's going to be really interesting. Uh, uh, we have some people who are, they've already demonstrated their resistance to some of the traditions of the council, which I think is good. And we have a big battle brewing right now over uh, who's in charge of uh, the Park and Planning Commission, uh, which is getting more hilarious pretty much by the moment. And so um, I think that's the issue to pay attention to, particularly because uh, Mark and Ben Kramer are striking at, at a weak uh, commission at this moment and a council made up of people who don't have any traditions with the Park and Planning Commission. Right. So how that falls out is I think gonna be a fascinating story moving forward. I am, the, I'd say get, get yourself a front row seat on that one. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Mara say, you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt wrote about the man in the arena and how the man in the arena needs to be applauded and to be commended. And I want to applaud you for making a run for county council this this past year. And I, I found when when I ran for county council, there were certain, you know, hot topics that dominated the political discussion. You know, what did you find in your your effort that people were really concerned about? What were the voters asking you about in that in that contest? You know, I think it also just reflects uh, the down county issues, but I think Thrive, uh, obviously, you know, throughout the whole county, uh, you know, and, and, le and let's be clear, I, I'm a millennial. I live in a high rise in downtown Wheaton. I'm all about, um, you know, responsible uh, development. But, you know, there are communities where folks, you know, they moved here 40 years ago and they live in their single family homes and they wanted to preserve the character of their neighborhoods. And so, you know, that was really heard loud and clear. And I had the anti-thrivers, the heart of the anti-thrivers in my district. So Aspen Hill. Um, and then obviously, you know, downtown urban Wheaton, which were, you know, the heart of uh, the pro thrivers. So it was, you know, it was, it was a very fascinating dynamic, but I think also uh, speaking to Nancy's point about just, you know, just the, uh, the lack of confidence in the planning board and just, um, you know, people really felt like Thrive was kind of, you know, pushed down their throats during a pandemic, um, even though there were a couple of virtual hearings, a lot of people, you know, I mean, we're talking about Zoom just people getting acclimated to Zoom, you know, Mike and I was sit, sitting on the board of trustees. Some, some members even had to get, you know, had to get training on Zoom. So I just, the public did not appreciate uh, having those, that being the, the num you know, the number one response to, hey, there was really a, a lack of transparency in this process. The other issue I would say, and if you guys think back to, you know, the SRO issue, you know, and law enforcement in schools. Um, and I think during, uh, you know, the, what happened at Magruder High School and there was a shooting, et cetera, so, you know, as a criminal defense attorney um, and, uh, you know, former member of the legislature, and I worked on uh, all this uh, public safety and criminal justice reform issues, but I actually, you know, was in support of, of, of having some sense of either SRO or some kind of uh, law enforcement presence, maybe not on school campuses, but maybe creating a network where, because really what it is, is that when, when, when a student or you know, youth is in trouble or there are some issues going on at home, et cetera, the SROs were really connecting that student to the resources that this yeah. public school yeah, yeah. system had. So mm -hmm. um, you know, those were some of the issues and the low morale are, uh, among uh, MCPD officers. That was a yeah. really big issue that would uh, was well, let's pivot. Problem. Let's pivot because we only have two minutes left in this, this topic to, and talk about you know, Thrive, but also the, the you know, the, cacophony of the entire planning board uh, being uh, uh, resigning in uh, mass. And uh, so Nancy, I'm going to say you to last because you, you, you're the expert on this. Uh, so briefly, Mark, uh, what, what do you think about Thrive, how it was handled, and the collateral damage in effect of the planning board resigning? 
It's funny, I don't always agree with Mark Elrich. There's an understatement, but I, I think, <laughs> I, I, you know, I agree. I mean, one of the problems with, is Thrive doesn't address affordable housing. And part of it is, is I don't think we're having a forthright conversation of the way in which our Montgomery County zoning policy inhibits land use policies that allow for affordable housing. Um, and I, I think one of the challenges of Thrive is it did not address that more centrally. Uh, it tried to kind of weave around with, a, with I frankly think, a, 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 a policy mix that really did not reflect the preferences for Montgomery County residents. Well, it, it's, it's fascinating how quickly this segment has gone. So, Nancy, I want to, I, Mike, not to, to, to ignore you, but Nancy, okay. we Nancy, only have Nancy was a planning board, what are you, planning board you, member. She's you, allowed to speak. Sum this, can you sum this up for us? Uh, Thrive was, is just talking. It's not doing. And that's it's really important for people to understand. Uh, I don't think it's a big deal at all. It really just summarizes uh, what Montgomery County has been doing all along. The real question, and this is the real question, is what's going on with the council and the planning board. Uh, there is uh, There are new revelations every day about why their uh, planning board uh, resigned wow. and why the planning director uh, was fired. And I mean, we're we're talking major soap opera here. So well, uh, we're gonna have gonna to we're fine. gonna have to wait till the next show to 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 see how the soap opera plays out. And when we come back from this short break, this is the hot topic right now. Does the county government have a vendetta against <laughs> drivers? Stay tuned. Well, we're going to have to move along because we have a short time period, but let's talk about bike lanes, particularly the lanes that were added on old Georgetown Road, where the geniuses in Rockville have reduced a six lane road to four by having dedicated bike lanes in each direction. Mark, there were there on the Nextdoor app, there were comments like the closing of Beach Drive, lanes taken away on old Georgetown Road seems to, there seems to be a vendetta against us people that need to go to work. What do you think? Quickly. Well, full disclosure, I did a piece on this with a duck pin called Virtue Cycling, which probably tells you where I come out on this. Listen, the census data shows there are only about 3,000 people in Montgomery County who commute by bicycle. They're overwhelmingly men, 77%, and young. Um, so this is over catering to a very, very, very small minority at the expense of the say 300,000 plus commuters that are in cars by themselves. All right, Nancy. Well, look, there've been deaths. Uh, there've been a lot of car fatal accidents with bicycles and cars. And there are places where they're speeding and sometimes uh, structural changes are important. But uh, limiting access to Beach Drive the way um, the District of Columbia is doing and Montgomery County hasn't said a word about it is has going to have a big impact on Kensington and uh, Silver Springites who travel that way to work. Of course, our work patterns are changing, so that's big. But go to downtown Silver Spring if you like. It's difficult to get around in a vehicle there because they've, li they've been limited more lanes than that over there, well, Casey. They hate and, drivers. Uh, they it, they I, hate I, drivers. I don't disagree with you. It's a deterrent, uh, certainly <laughs> to shoppers and people using the retail. Uh, in that vicinity. Uh, All right, so Marase and Mike, each have about 30 seconds. Marase. Just a heads up, we have $110 million that we're going to be using and the state and the state delegations on board that we're going to, we're in 55 million of the, of that, of those funds are going to be right here in downtown Wheaton. So the, the bike lane network is just going to expand. <laughs> and Mike. I have to say that's primarily a down county issue. If we have bike lanes up here, they generally only go a block or two and then they stop. The biggest problem we have with bike lanes or, or lack of bike lanes is the fact that people come up from down county on the weekends and take up all of our roads with all of their pelotons. That's the biggest challenge we see when it comes to pumps to bike lanes. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I left my spandex at home. Um, so I just oh. want to say I'm, 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 I'm thrilled that everyone is upset about the bike lanes as much as I am. And I, Andrew Friedson. <laughs> is your district one council member. <laughs> Complain to Andrew because even during non-rush hours, the backup on, on old Georgetown Road in front of the new high school that's being built is insane. Anyway, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> Stay tuned for Party Shots. And welcome back. Now with Party Shots, Nancy Florine. Well, first of all, I wish everybody uh, a great uh, new year. 
Uh, but if you want to stay tuned uh, to uh, more gossip than this show will provide you, uh, sign up for uh, Adam Pagnuco's uh, new newsletter and blog, Montgomery Perspective. That he Adam is giving us the down and dirty on state and local politics going forward. It's going to be fun. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, Mark Anka for your party shot. Well, I can't help but just acknowledge what Casey has done over the years as our uh, host of 21 this week. You know, it's important for us to be able to hear a diversity of views, uh, to get out of our collective bubbles uh, <laughs> and to, to share, you know, share ideas, but also to find out where we have common ground as well. So thank you, Casey, for being our host here. I didn't pay you for that, by the way. Uh, you know, there, <laughs> well, there was, actually, no, you did. Didn't. I got the pullover anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Knapp, your parting shot. Thanks. Thank you. And I also would extend my best wishes for a holiday season and a wonderful new year, new year to everyone. And also my my thanks to Casey for, for corralling us all together. Um, I think one of the interesting things will be is we have a new governor and, and new legislators. And I think the new governor has an, has an exciting vision. It can go a long way and can do some really, really fun things for the state and really takes a good direction. But I'm curious, um, the, gov the, the the last governor in our county executive didn't, didn't get along well and the whole expectation was because it was Democrat and Republican. And I'll be really curious to see if our county executive can get along with the Democratic governor and what that means ultimately for what the what gets done in Montgomery County and working with the state. You know, Mike, there, there, he probably doesn't like anybody. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Mara say, I'm sorry. It's your parting shot. Mara say, Morales. For, for the record, I am for the bike lanes, but um, I'm wishing everybody a, a healthy uh, holiday, both physically and mentally. We're dealing with a lot of mental health issues, the winter blues and, uh, you know, suicidal issues. Um, but uh, I guess parting shot for the upcoming year, I would just say that I am so, so thrilled to see the new members of the county council. And I just I just hope that everybody will have full confidence in all the new leaders. Um, and I'm just really excited to, 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 see, to, to see that new generation and see how it benefits the county. Well, we've got a lot of new changes coming up, obviously with a new governor and a new legislature elected, but also a very important expansion of our county council and, and the, the six new members. I think it's gonna be really wonderful to, to see. Now, Sunday evening, uh, when this show is, is aired, Hanukkah will start at sundown. And I'm wishing everybody a happy Hanukkah and also a Merry Christmas as we enter into the, the Christmas season. Uh, and that's a wrap. We'll see you in 2023.